Welcome to Once Upon a Town, the show where we delve into Franklin history. I'm Eamon McCarthy Earls. And I'm Joe Landry. So Joe, today we'll be talking about the Cataldo block That's in right. downtown. Right. There was actually two, two Cataldo blocks. There's the Felix Cataldo block and the AJ Cataldo block. Today we'll be talking about the Felix Cataldo block. Today, the, this is what the Felix Cataldo block looks like today. Um, it's the Franklin Center for the, Franklin School for the, for the Performing Arts. And it's on Main Street, right at the foot of De Dean Avenue. Uh, very familiar to everybody. Um, it was originally known as the New Ray Block at the time it was constructed in 1907. And for a very brief period of time, it was also known as the Geb Block when Jacob Geb bought it in 1922. But the following year, he. Uh, it was sold to Felix J. Cataldo, and at that point, I think he's the one that renamed it the Felix Cataldo Block. But for about a year or so, it was known as the Geb Block. Be previous to that, it was the, the new Ray Block. And then in the map of 1888, we see two small buildings between the Dana Block location, which is number 53, and the Hotel Darling, which is number 8. You can see the number eight right up on the top of the building. It's not right down at street level. Um, and then uh, number 64 is where a guy by the name of John McConkey had his merchant tailor. He was a merchant tailor there. Number 21 was where Razzie and Elman Sanborn's express office was. Smith's news store would be there too. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, number eight was the Hotel Darling, uh, which would later become the Hotel Windsor until it was demolished in 1907. So, in 1907, it is understood that with the advent of spring, a new brick block was going to go up on the lot adjoining the Hotel Windsor, uh, which will accommodate a goodly number of tenants and up-to-date in every respect, and under the inspection of the manager of the Ray estate, who was Joseph G. Ray. Uh, now, this Joseph G. Ray is, it was the son of Edgar and Margaret Ray. Uh, not to be confused with his great uncle, who was also named Joseph Ray. Who was one of the two founding brothers of sort of the Ray fortune in the 1830s and 1840s and so that's, forth. That's correct. And then their father was Joseph Ray. We sometimes refer to him as Colonel Joseph Ray. So uh, this is the youngest Ray, and he was the son of Edgar Ray, and he managed the estate. Um, so at present, the small one-story buildings, and we'll see a picture of that in a minute, there was two little small buildings which were next to, which were actually between the Dana Block and the Hotel Windsor. Well, apparently those two small one-story buildings did not afford adequate returns, so suitable a location as land costs, noting Skyward, it is safe to say that the new building will meet all the requirements in that particular. Wow. <laughs> so, so there was that. And so here's a, an article that appeared in February. Fontaine and Kinnicutt, architects of Woonsocket, have drawn up the plans for the new business block. The building will be of brick, two stories high, and used for stores and offices. Now here's a picture of the Hotel Darling. Uh, it was owned by Nathan Darling, and in the 1890s it became the Hotel Windsor. However, in July of 1902, P. D. Feely purchased the hotel and renamed it the Hotel Quaddy. But a few months later, Archie McLaughlin purchased it, and he changed the name back to the Hotel Windsor. And then, in March of 1907, the announcement was made by Archie McLaughlin. He has informed the guests of the house that the hotel would close Saturday night, and all the guests had to find new accommodations as soon as possible. The hotel will be torn down to make room for the new Ray Block, which will be soon commenced. So he's, Mr. McLaughlin has been on the lookout for another hotel out of town, and it's understood he will locate in one of the surrounding towns. And it's interesting to note in the final sentence of this, the reference to borders. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a much, probably, probably much greater number of people sort of long-term living in, in many mm -hmm. of these hotels, almost as boarding houses or, or That's right. maybe like the, uh, the chain today, extended stay America. That's right. And down on Depot Street, you had the, uh, I think they called it the American House, uh, later on, that's where the train stop was. And they had upstairs was like a little a boarding house. There were people that lived there, so it, it wasn't really a hotel per se. It was a boarding house, as you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now here's a picture that shows those two small buildings, and to the right of it you can see just a little bit of the Hotel Darling, and to the left you can see the Dana Block, which still is there to this day, actually. So 
The article says that instead of tearing down the small buildings next to the Hotel Windsor to make way for the new block, they've been purchased by a gentleman by the name of Enoch Waite. He was a gentleman that had a factory over an Alpine place and uh, down where Bulliken had his oil tanks. And later on, that became uh, American Felt, or part of American Felt. But Enoch Waite was supposed to remove those buildings around the 1st of April. I haven't really seen anything that says that they actually did remove the buildings or if they just said, oh, let's just tear them down. I, don't, I haven't really seen anything on yeah. that. But one way or the other, they, they had to be removed and the Hotel Windsor was to be torn down. And I'll just bring our viewers' attention to a couple of things. Mm -hmm. The sign above the awning says uh, Smith's News Store, right. and they also are selling Moxie, That's the, right. the classic New England soda. A couple uh, of months ago, I bought a bottle. I said, I've got to try this. I have to see what Moxie was all about. It's definitely an acquired taste. There's no question I, I about have, it. I have that acquired taste. <laughs> you like Moxie? I love that stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was... That was my one bottle, and <laughs> I think that's it for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it is understood that the local Masons were endeavoring to induce Mr. Ray to build a third story on the, on the hall so they, could, so they could put up a hall up on the third story. But apparently Mr. Ray said, no, two stories is fine. But there was talk of hopefully talking him into a third story. That was in March. Now there were businesses that were doing business uh, in those buildings uh, and downstairs in where the Hotel Windsor was. One of them was called the Burns, Com Burns Clothing Company. And uh, as with the Smith's uh, newsstand, there was a barbershop there, Joe Savina's barbershop, uh, and a few other businesses. They had to move out of there temporarily so that they could demolish the buildings or get rid of the buildings and build the new Ray Block, and then they could move back. And most of them did. Uh, Burns Clothing did move back. Uh, Franklin, um, I, I say Franklin News. I remember it as Franklin News, but it was really Smith's newsstand at that time. They moved back. Uh, as did, um, and I said Burns, uh, and Josephina uh, also moved back. But uh, so they, in, in the case of the Burns Clothing Company, uh, they moved to the music hall, uh, which was the upstairs in the Metcalf block. And then this picture was taken around 1907, just after the new Ray block was constructed. Uh, I'm looking at that building, and it, it kind of looks like the stores are not occup occupied yet. And it looks like the building is fairly new, so I'm guessing this is a, certainly shortly thereafter the, the building was built. And then the, in September of 1907, matters are being rushed for the new Ray Block, and the tenants hope to get in there in about a month. Um, on the ground floor, the Burns Clothing Company will have their old store on the north, which is the far right. Mrs. Smith, uh, new, her new store coming next, and the Vena Barbershop adjoining it. Oh, and then the Caterer Dupi will be the next with a first-class cafe. And then the a jeweler by the name of Smith will have the last store and will devote quite a portion of it to his growing optical business. Um, so uh, the, the block was fast being built, and you can see the people are starting to come back. And then, as I mentioned before, in 1922, Representative Jacob Gebb has taken over the E.K. Ray block. That would be Edgar K. Ray, Joseph Ray's father which will be purchased next month, being one of the most valuable blocks in town. And so in 1923, Felix Cataldo did purchase it from Mr. Gebb, and I'm sure that at that time, that's when he renamed it the Felix J. Cataldo block. And it sounds like Gebb at that point in time must have been basically the state rep for, for Franklin? He was, uh, he was in politics, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there it is right here. The Gebb block on Main Street, formerly owned by the Ray estate, is the property of ex-representative Jacob F. Gebb and have been sold to Felix Cataldo of Washington Street, who will take possession today. So that was in March of 1923. Yep, there you go. Now this picture dates back, it really is between 1928 and 1930. And I can say with, with all certainty that that's between 1928 and 1930 because the arrow points to the Morse block and you can see that it's only a two-story building. That means, uh, that the fire had occurred in February 1928. And you can see Burns clothing to the far right. And Burns clothing would then become Louis Cataldo's store in 1929 or 1930. I think it was 1930. So that's why I can tell you this picture was definitely between 28 and 30. Good sort of thing. Hmm. And I, the cars, well, I'm, 
I, I really, I, I don't know my cars that well to see if, you know, what, what years they were, but they, you know, you can tell they're vintage uh, for that year, so, yep. And then here's an, article, here's, uh, an advertising from the 1893 uh, resident book. Uh, go to Smith's new store. Uh, they had all sorts of things. 38 Main Street, they kept the same address when, on, the, on the new block. And then the barbershop in the Cataldo block, and this is 1926 now, uh, recently vacated by Joseph Vina, was being painted by Joseph Tomaselli, and Joe De Caesar was going to occupy that shop. So a new barber shop, uh, a new barber was going in there. And I can tell you that in that location, uh, my memory of that was uh, for 38, um, for 3080 uh, Main Street, they literally took that one store and divided, added a, a, a wall right down the middle, and they created two, like 38A and 38B. They, t they created two stores out of one. The store to the left was the barber shop. The store to the right was Smith's newsstand, which later became Franklin News, owned by Guerri Sacconi's family. Uh, and then when the barber shop left there, in later years, uh, Fred DiRico would have a business there called Fr Friendly Realty and Friendly Travel Agency. Eventually, he'd move over to Louis Cataldo's building, uh, uh, Louis Cataldo's store, when Louis Cataldo retired. So. Mm -hmm. And then in 1930, um, here we go, uh, this is when uh, Jules Burns sold his business to Louis J. Cataldo, and it then became uh, Cataldo's, uh, Cataldo's uh, uh, clothing. And in expressing my thanks to my many friends for the patronage which you have given this store, I hope that they will continue to have the same home feeling for Mr. Cataldo. So, and if Mr. Cataldo says, I've just purchased a stock in good of Burns and Company. Uh, Mr. Burns has consented to be with us a while and Francis Cody will remain his manager and so on. So that's kind of nice. And then in that building, I think it was upstairs, they had uh, Allied Gold Dealers. These are typical businesses that mm -hmm. were in that bl block in the 1930s. Uh, one particular building, uh, one particular business was John Costello. In later years, he um, had a, co a package store there, Costello's Package Store. And eventually that moved down to East Central Street and it became J.B. Liquors, or J.P. Liquors, I think, or, yeah. Speaking of rums, yeah. gins, and cordials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in 1939, Florence Mason had a ladies' shop in there. And uh, we cordially invite the public to drop in and inspect our new store and take advantage of the new lower prices. And I note that uh, it says across from Norfolk County Trust Company, which was the bank, I'm guessing, that occupied the Ray Block at that point in time. Exactly. Uh, There's quite a history of the banks in that building. And at one time, they used to refer to that as the bank building. Uh, Norfolk County bought out Franklin National Bank, which was there for many years. And so Norfolk County was there for a while until the early 50s when they built their new building on the corner of Emmons Street and Main Street, which is today's Bank of America. Hmm. That was built uh, originally for Norfolk County Trust. And they must have got, somehow gotten up, gotten bought up by uh, well, Bank of America or something well, like that at that let's, point. Let's see. They went, <laughs> I, I think I got this right. They went from Norfolk County Trust to South Shore National to Bay Bank to <laughs> <laughs> you know, banks, you I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, I live in North Attleboro, and there was Attleboro Trust, Attleboro Savings, Durfee Attleboro, et cetera, et cetera. So banks just kept emerging uh, with each other. But you know, not for county trust, you're right. That was um, there. Yep. And then here's a picture that was taken from 1961, and you can see uh, Costello's package store there, Franklin News. Uh, you can see how Franklin News was on the right side of that store. Um, and then upstairs you had different businesses. You had lawyers up there, some dentists were up there, uh, f some photography studios were up there. Um, there were other stores in that uh, block, uh, some women's stores. There was one business called the Carousel. Uh, in later years, there was one called the La Bottega. I think the Fienza family owned that one. Uh, and then other businesses as well. So. And it's interesting that Franklin News had that much of a heritage to it. They, they mm. persisted, you know, obviously, with different ownership right. um, up until very recently, actually, the past few years when they finally, right. they finally closed up there, right. and seated over their, their slot to uh, FSPA. That's right, yep. So that's really the Felix J. Cataldo block. Joe, you wanted to talk about the block next door as well, the Dana block. That's right. It has a pretty good history, and uh, let's talk about it. 
This is the Dana block as it appears today. And you can obviously see the Felix Cataldo block right next door. Um, that's the way it looks today. It's got, uh, uh, let's see, Teddy Gallagher's, and it's an Irish pub. And I'm not really sure what the business is next door, but uh, that's what's there today. Um, uh, this, this particular view was taken from the 1888 map of Franklin. And number 53 identifies the building that was there before the Dana block. It was a wooden structure, and we'll see a picture of that in a few minutes. Um, as you can see, a, a gentleman by the name of Howard S. Wilkes had a drugstore there at that time. So they had a drugstore there in later years, too, and we'll talk about that, too. <laughs> in fact, I noticed that they spelt uh, Mrs., Mr. Wilkes's name incorrectly on the, on the table there. It's, you know, they misspelt his name, but uh, it is Wilkes, W-I-L-K-E-S. So, uh, and in 1890, H.S. Wilkes and A.C. Dana have applied for druggists' licenses on the sixth class, whatever that was. So they went to classes and they became druggists. Now, this is the building that was there uh, in 1880. That's where the, the Dana block is currently located. It looks like there's some signs uh, that you can actually almost make out there. Mm -hmm. One on the uh, one on the left. It's hard to read the the top word there, but it says mm. looks like it says it's uh, some sort of advertisement for perfume. I think you're and right. And the little awning down to the lower left, mm -hmm. pretty much at basement level, says soda on it. Right. Yeah. So I, it could be that the drugstore was on the right side or something. But yeah, that's yeah, good observation. But yeah, that's a building that was there, uh, in, certainly in 1880. And then the Sanborn Fire map of 1889 shows that building. With the rather cryptic yeah. drugs that's as the right. only description for the entire building. That's right, that's right, yeah. Um, and then here's a couple of, uh, an advertisement that appeared in 1891. Uh, Wilkes Drugstore was opposite the post office. The post office, of course, was in the Ray Block at that time on the corner of Depot Street and Main Street. That's why they refer to it as being opposite the post office. Um, and then workmen have been busy this week putting up the tile floor for the new quarters. So apparently Wilkes was moving his drugstore up, up the street a ways to the A.B. Fletcher building. And so he moved out of there in 1891. I have to say, I love the advertisement here. Cocoa wine for nervous dyspepsia and all stomach difficulties. <laughs> Beef, iron, and wine. Wow. That's good for what ails you. <laughs> I guess so. And then in, in 1893, it was reported that A.C. Dana will put up a brick block at the head of Depot Street. That would be the new Dana block. And this is interesting. It's, uh, the building that's now on the location will be moved to the rear of the lot and turned a quarter round. And I found that interesting. So, wow. So look at this. Here's from the 18, uh, 1894 Sanborn Fire Insurance map. Sure enough, that building to the rear looks like that building. It looks like they moved it back, and they turned it at a 45-degree angle. But what I found fascinating, it looks like they had to take part of the building off on the front to uh, make way for the new data block. You can see the 45-degree the angle on the front of the building, which is strange. Do you have a sense from the fire maps, those little kind of hash marks on the side of, uh, on the, side of the buildings? I'm not sure mm. if, our, if our viewers can see that on their screens. But, yeah. Um, are those doorways or windows or something like that? Is that that's very possible? I guess um, maybe windows. It seems like there'd be, there'd be an awfully large number of uh, number mm, of doors you know, for I think a building like that to have. That's a good observation. I think you're right. Uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. I think so. I know on these old fire maps, if you saw a building with an X in it, that was like a stable or a barn. So yep. And then Dana's block. Uh, the out, this is back in 1893 as the building was being constructed. The outside of the Dana block, uh, it, except for the front, is nearly completed. The first floor contains two stores and the stairway to the upper floors. The second story contains four large square rooms for business purposes, and the third story would probably be finished for a hall and rented to one or more organizations, and we're going to see where that, that was the case. Uh, Hosey Brothers have completed their work on the steam fixtures. This is now April 1894. Uh, they finished their work on the steam fixtures up in the hall on the third floor, and they're putting the finishing touches on the woodwork. The hall was finished in natural wood, which is being filled and coated with shellac. I never was up on that in, the, in that building. Up, I've only been in the first floor, um, but I never was up there, so I really, 
I, I kind of wish I had I had seen it, what it looked like. And I'm curious who occupies it these days. I'm actually not sure if there's even a tenant right now on the second floor. Uh, second floor, good question. I really don't know. Uh, third floor, there's nobody up there because it's not there anymore. <laughs> we'll see that in a few minutes. Now, the new hall of the Red Men, the Red Men's uh, Wanwak tribe, were the ones that uh, took over the third floor. And it's rap rapidly nearing completion and will be occupied for the first time on May 7th. Uh, from present indications, it is likely to be one of the finest lodge rooms in town. Yeah. Now, we talked about uh, A.C. Dana. He was Albert C. Dana. And his store was, and this is from the 1888 Fletcher, uh, 1888 Mortimer Blake book, and it shows the Dana store in the far left of the uh, Fletcher block. And he was there in the early 1880s. And uh, you can see that. And then he would move his store to the newly built Dana block in 1893. And then this is a picture of that store uh, when it was still in the Fletcher block. But the, the real interesting picture that I recently discovered was this one. We can see the Chilson block to the left, but you can see AC Dana to the right. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that the Fletcher block was fairly new at that time. You can see, it looks like it's almost brand new at that point. Uh, so there it is there. Yep. And then this is where you can see the Dana block uh, right in the middle of the picture. Uh, we know that this was between 1900 and 1907 because 1900 was the year that the streetcar tracks were put down. And 1907 was the year that the Hotel Windsor was torn down and the uh, Felix Vitaldo block was built. So this picture dates between 1900 and 1907. And then there's a later picture of the Dana block. And um, when this picture was taken, the pharmacy was known as A.C. Dana and Son. And I did some research, and I found that uh, Albert's son, William G. Dana, was also a druggist. So they were in business together. And it's fascinating. You can see the, the big um, sort of sculpture outside of the, uh, the mm. apothecary. Uh, All sort right. Of, Absolutely. Sort of, uh, yeah. Grinder yeah. for, for mm -hmm. compounds. That's right. Yeah. And then in later years, uh, this was 1934, Costello the Clother was uh, going out of business at that time. Um, apparently that was the last day he was selling out. Um, and in later years, b such businesses as, uh, there was a beauty shop in there, I think it was called Gano's. Then um, there was a gentleman, uh, I forget his name now, but he had a beauty shop in there as well um, for quite a few years. Uh, and then upstairs, different lawyers and uh, other businesses, some dentists were probably up there. Uh, Dana the Druggist became uh, uh, became owned by a gentleman named uh, Robert Howe, and then eventually he sold out to Ray Neighbor, and he renamed the business Puritan Drugs. We'll see that in a few minutes. And in 1942, there was a small fire down in the basement of the Dana block. Uh, it was caused by defective wires, but quick action averted the blaze in the business district, so just did some damage, but apparently it was, you know, they repaired it. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Bob Howe uh, took over the business. This was taken from the 1952 Oski yearbook, Franklin High School yearbook. Uh, he was the registered pharmacist at that time. And then in later years, as I mentioned, uh, became known as Puritan Drugs, owned by Ray Neighbor. And is this from a, a picture related to a different fire, or is this a parade here? Because it looks like a fire engine in the, the right-hand right side of the picture here. We're going to see the, the full picture of this in a few minutes. This was the year where uh, they had a fire up on the third floor, where that hall was, and it did damage, enough to damage that they, 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 they repaired the building, but they did away with the third floor. So it, to this day, it's now just a two-story building. So yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing that in a few minutes as well. And then, like I say, in 1954, uh, the, it became Puritan Drugs. Here's a picture that was taken from the yearbook. I can remember many a time sitting at that fountain uh, having sodas or whatever. And what's interesting, you can see the gentleman sitting there with the hat. Uh, back in those days, if you wanted a soda or Coca-Cola, you had that, that Dixie cup type thing with a, the, uh, the holder on the bottom. And what they would do is they would put uh, Coca-Cola syrup and soda water and mix it up, and that was your Coke. Hmm. Yeah. And then this is another shot looking towards the rear of the store, also from, the, from that vintage. And then here's the fire, as we mentioned. 
Uh, this fire was sometime during the 70s. And uh, like I said, the damage was confined to the third floor, although well, there may be some maybe smoke and maybe water damage to the building, but they were able to save it and today it's just a two-story building. One of the things that's very interesting about many of our programs is we've seen how, uh, in a lot of ways, the um, sort of roof line of, of downtown Franklin has, has eroded over time where <laughs> we've actually lost tall buildings that's instead right. of uh, instead of gain them, the exception right. of some new new condominiums going up right now as we're, as we're recording this program. Right. Um, pretty much every building in downtown is no more than two stories with the exception of one uh, right, near the, right near the corner that apparently survived with no fires and no teardowns. <laughs> right, well, another example of a building that had a fire and they did away with the third floor was the corner of Cottage Street and East Central Street that was uh, damaged uh, as a result of the 1928 Morris Opera House fire. So that's now a two-story building, which used to be a three-story building. Uh, so you're right, yeah. So. And then behind the Dana block was this little building, Stewart's Press. And I'm pretty sure that's Herbert Stewart in the picture. And of course, Herbert Stewart is well known in Franklin from the early 1900s to the 70s. Every year he would march in the Memorial Day Parade, play the bugle, play taps. And uh, for over 70 years, 70 consecutive years, he would do that, and he, it was a source of great pride for him to do that. And was he a World War I veteran himself? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, he was definitely involved with the fire department, so he would wear his fire department uniform, and he would march with them. But I don't know if he was a veteran or not. That's a good question. But uh, no. And so that concludes our talk on the Dana Block. Joe, thanks for the walkthrough. A great explanation. Yeah, it was great talking to you too, Eamon. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Until next time, I'm Eamon McCarthy Earls. And I'm Joe Landry. Thanks for watching. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.